हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा China is threatening war on Taiwan but it also wants to play peacemaker in Ukraine. This alone should sum up the dragon's duplicity. Chinese warships and warplanes are zeroing in on Taiwan because Taiwan's president met the US House Speaker in California. The same China is calling for peace between Russia and Ukraine and legitimizing China's role is France. President Emmanuel Macron of France is in Beijing. He says Europe should not decouple from China. Why is Macron appeasing Xi Jinping? How does it help him? We'll discuss. Meanwhile, China is at the center of another major development. The foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia and Iran are in Beijing to figure out the next steps in their truce. Where does that leave the US? It appears it will have to learn to live with the dragon. We're also bringing you a special report on what the IMF has said about India's digital infrastructure. But first, the headlines. Russia rules out Chinese mediation on Ukraine. Kremlin says Beijing can be a potential mediator but sees no prospect right now. It vows to press on with its offensive in Ukraine. Donald Trump calls for defunding the FBI and the Justice Department. He says Republicans should slash their funds till these bodies quote unquote come to their senses. This comes just today after Trump faced criminal charges for falsifying business records. The Reserve Bank of India has stopped its interest rate hike cycle for the first time in nearly a year. It says it's because of quote unquote unprecedented uncertainty in the global markets. Will the creators of ChatGPT be taken to court? An Australian mayor could be the first person to sue the AI powered chatbot. Brian Hood has sent a legal notice to the parent company OpenAI. Chad GPT apparently falsely called the mayor a criminal in a corruption case which he exposed. And the earth records its second warmest March ever. The Antarctic sea ice also shrinks to a new record low. These are the findings of the EU's climate monitoring agency. The hottest March on record was 2016. We start with Taiwan and this may sound like an old story but it's not. This happened today. Chinese warships have surrounded Taiwan. China is raising the specter of war again, all because Taiwan's president had a meeting. A meeting with Kevin McCarthy, he is the speaker of the US House of Representatives, the third senior most person in the US government. America called it an informal engagement, but China was upset. Then the Taiwanese president asked for more weapons. China was even more upset. It is now threatening a quote unquote resolute response. The United States and Taiwan are colluding with each other, using transit as a pretext to condone Taiwan's independent separatists, to engage in political activities in the United States, carry out official exchanges between the United States and Taiwan, and exchange substantive relations between the two countries. China will take resolute and strong measures to firmly defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity. And China has wasted no time in walking the talk. PLA warships are targeting Taiwan. There is tension in the air. There's another Chinese buildup, and here's why it's dangerous. China may or may not want to attack immediately, but such military buildups create a powder keg. One wrong move, and it blows up. Which is why the world is watching this closely. Taiwan's defense ministry shared an update this morning, a flash about what China was up to. Taipei detected one PLA aircraft and three vessels near the island. They were spotted at 6 a.m. local time. And that's not all. China has deployed a carrier strike group near Taiwan. This is the Shandong aircraft carrier. It is around 370 kilometers from the island. And what's the carrier doing there? Apparently, it's on a training exercise. The timing is interesting. Taiwan is carefully monitoring all these movements. It's clear what the PLA is trying to do here. It is trying to build pressure. In fact, this is a pattern. China sends warplanes and warships. They come close to Taiwan, close enough for their presence to be registered, and then they leave. Such incursions serve only one purpose: 
This is China trying to remind Taiwan that it's within striking distance, that the Chinese military can reach Taiwan within minutes, and this is a way to keep the threat of invasion alive. China keeps getting more aggressive. Earlier it was just sending warships. Now it is harassing civilian ships too. China has launched a new operation today. They're calling it a special joint patrol. It's happening in the Taiwan Strait, specifically in the central and northern parts of the region. This is a three-day operation and this is what it entails. China will carry out on-site inspections. It will check cargo ships and construction vessels. Again, these are not military ships, these are civilian ships. China has decided it wants to inspect all ships that pass through this region. Who appointed them? The police. This is a way to harass civilian ships in the name of security. Taiwan has lodged a strong protest. It says it won't cooperate. It has issued orders to this effect. Shipping operators have been told to turn down inspection requests by China and they must also notify Taiwan's Coast Guard for assistance. This time the maneuver by the Shandong aircraft carrier is different because although it has been out on the open sea many times, this is its first time in the South China Sea. At that location, we also, this is also part of training. That's how we see it. But as this is a quite a sensitive period, there is reason for that. Our military is also doing its research. We may have plans. But I won't be going more into that. Knowing China, it's unlikely to back down, especially after yesterday's event. The U.S. is hosting Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen. She was in California yesterday. She was hosted by the new U.S. House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy's predecessor was Nancy Pelosi. Last year, she visited Taiwan. She was the highest-ranking American official to visit Taiwan in 25 years. And now Kevin McCarthy is taking it forward. He created history too when he met Tsai Ing-wen yesterday. Kevin McCarthy is now the senior most American politician to have met a Taiwanese leader on U.S. soil since 1979. And he didn't come alone. McCarthy was accompanied by a bipartisan delegation. Both Democrats and Republicans were in attendance. It was the perfect opportunity for the Taiwanese leader. And she made the most of it. Here's what she said. Their presence and unwavering support reassure the people of Taiwan that we are not isolated and we are not alone. I also highlighted a belief which President Reagan championed that to preserve peace, we must be strong. I would like to add that we are stronger when we are together. President Tsai wants more weapons from Taiwan. And what was McCarthy's response? He supported her. He said the U.S. should sell more arms to Taiwan. We must continue the arms sales to Taiwan and make sure such sales reach Taiwan on a very timely basis. Second, we must strengthen our economic cooperation, particularly with trade and technology. Third, we must continue to promote our shared values on the world stage. So Taiwan can bank on America. They want independence and they have bipartisan support in the U.S. Because there is a growing and deep hostility towards China, not just in the United States, but around the world. And this works for Taiwan. Thank you. It is asking for more weapons. It may also get more weapons. But remember, this is a slippery slope. More arms would mean a stronger response from China, and that will raise the risk of conflict. We're not sure Taiwan, or even the U.S., is ready for that scenario. The U.S. and its military allies are turning their focus towards the Indo-Pacific. I'm talking about NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a military alliance between America and Europe. It started with about 12 members. Their main adversary was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union disintegrated some 30 years back, but NATO kept expanding. Today, it touches Russia's border and it has 31 members. We'll talk about the newest member, Finland. In fact, we have an exclusive interview coming up with Finland's foreign minister. But first, let's cover the Indo-Pacific. For years, the world has dreaded a NATO versus Russia war. It's happening as we speak. Now, should we also brace for a NATO versus China war? Because NATO has specific ambitions and it's spelling them out. 
It had a meeting on Tuesday. Foreign ministers of all NATO member states were present. Some non-NATO allies were also there, like Japan, New Zealand and Australia. Also the deputy foreign minister of South Korea. And what's common among these four countries? None of them is a NATO member. All of them are in the Indo-Pacific. And they've all agreed to engage more with the NATO. What happens in your region, what happens in the Indo-Pacific matters for Europe. And what happens in Europe matters uh, for for, for you, and I think the war in Ukraine demonstrates this very clearly with its global ramifications. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the fact that we also see that uh, China and Russia are standing closer together makes it just even more important that we are uh, uh, standing together as partners, NATO allies, and, uh, and you as uh, four highly valued partners. This is what NATO Secretary General said at the meeting. Highly valued partners, that's what NATO calls Japan, New Zealand, Australia and South Korea. And Japan, for one, has committed to boosting cooperation with NATO. It said it cannot achieve the goal of a free and open Indo-Pacific on its own. So it needs NATO. And NATO is sending feelers to another country in the Indo-Pacific. A country that has exchanged physical blows with China. A country whose military is actually looking China in the eye and challenging China's belligerence every step of the way. I'm talking about India. Last week, the U.S. ambassador to NATO said this, and I'm quoting, NATO's door is open to more cooperation if India seeks that. NATO is more than happy to sit down any time with India. And NATO is sitting down with India. Just last month, the NATO team was in India for what's being called a secret meeting. The first of its kind between NATO and Indian officials on Indian soil. And do you know what was discussed? The situation in the Indo-Pacific and a roadmap of cooperation between India and NATO. Now, just in ca case it wasn't clear, when NATO says it wants to play a bigger role in the Indo-Pacific, it basically means it wants to do more to challenge China. And obviously, it cannot challenge China on its own. It needs partners in the region. And that's what it's trying to find in countries like India, partners in the fight against China. Last year, NATO recognized China as a systemic challenge. And it has been trying to get its skin in the Indo-Pacific game ever since. This does not mean that countries in the region, countries like India, will become NATO members. India is not pursuing that just yet. It means they'll work together if it comes to that. Like NATO is doing with Ukraine. When Russia invaded, NATO rushed to Ukraine's defense. Weapon systems, ammunition... A lot of money and moral support, NATO is giving all of it to Ukraine. This is a de facto Russia versus NATO war. And it has inspired more countries to join the NATO security umbrella. The newest member is Finland. It joined the alliance on Tuesday. This is a country that remained neutral for decades. It did not take sides even at the height of the Cold War, but now it has. And joining us is the foreign minister of Finland, Mr. Pekka Havisto. He is with us from Amsterdam. And this is a First Post exclusive. Mr. Pekka Havisto, welcome to First Post. And congratulations on your success in joining the NATO. What does it mean for Finland? Thank you for us. It means a lot because the Finns are very security-oriented people. And, and since last February, when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, we have been witnessing war in Europe. And at this moment, of course, we feel that uh, we are not defending ourselves only alone, but we have the support of the 30 other NATO countries helping us if anything goes to to wrong direction. Finland and Sweden applied for membership together. Turkey was the hurdle. You crossed it. Sweden could not cross it. How did you pull it off? And what concessions did Finland make? Was there a backroom deal? Well, there was not a background deal. We, of course, established last summer in Madrid, you know, NATO summit, uh, a working group or tripartite working group between Sweden, Finland and Turkey. We went through some of those concerns of Turkey, including terrorism, the PKK, which is a terrorist organization that is forbidden both in, uh, not only in Turkey, but also in Finland and Sweden. We discussed about the Gulenists, we discussed about the Syrian YPG and other Kurdish groups. And we, of course, found out that we have different legislation in, in our countries compared with uh, Turkey. But uh, it's important that uh, in Finland there were no provocations against Turkey during these negotiations and so forth. 
uh, and we know that Sweden is uh, changing something in their terrorist legislation uh, happening uh, first days of uh, June, and, and this hopefully helps also now uh, Sweden to join NATO. Of course, uh, our uh, accession is not complete until Sweden is also a member, because we have a very close military cooperation with Sweden traditionally. Nuclear weapons are a core component of NATO's deterrence, but Finland has always called nuclear weapons illegal. You have a strong record of non-proliferation. Is that position going to change now? Will Finland bring nuclear weapons on its soil? And will it come up with a new policy on nuclear weapons? Well, currently, we have a legislation that prevents nuclear material or nuclear weapons to be transferred to Finnish soil and, and there has not been discussion of changing that legislation. My understanding is that actually those nuclear weapons that uh, NATO has or are controlled by NATO is, is permanently located to certain places in, in Europe and I haven't heard any particular uh, decisions or plans to change those locations. Is Finland looking to change its policy? Well, we haven't changed uh, anything in our policy, of course. When joining NATO, you accept that part of the deterrence is, is also that uh, NATO has nuclear weapons or NATO countries have, has, have nuclear weapons. But also the NATO policy is that it would be better to have a nuclear-free world, but so that every country uh, quits nuclear weapons. So now Finland is fundamentally okay with the idea of nuclear weapons? Currently, we understand that NATO as an organization and NATO countries uh, have also the nuclear deterrence. I understand NATO has been in talks with India. There have been reports of closed-door meetings. Do you see a shift on India's part, a willingness to do more with NATO? As a member of NATO, do you also think that India should engage more actively with this alliance? Well, one of the topics that we discussed in a NATO foreign minister's meeting was, of course, the Indo-Pacific issues, discussed about the China, discussed about the Taiwan issue. And in many uh, uh, speeches, also the role of India actually as, as a close partner to European Union and to many NATO countries was mentioned. And of course, uh, also Finland during the recent years have established quite close cooperation with, with India. Minister Jai Shankar has been visiting Finland as well and we have a, a good communication with India. What role do you see for the NATO in the Indo-Pacific? Well, of course, uh, one role for NATO, NATO countries is to, to keep the Taiwan Straits open for commercial uh, traffic and, and uh, maintain the, the freedom of uh, maritime movement and, and so forth. I think that's one of the key issues. And of course, we, we, we see different risks also of uh, conflicts escalating in, in, the, in the Pacific area. And, and, uh, but of course, NATO, NATO's role is to defend uh, NATO territories and territories of NATO countries. Mr. Pekka Havistu, thank you very much for joining us here on First Post and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Good talking to you. French President Emmanuel Macron is in China. He's an embattled leader who's left his own country burning to apparently find peace for another. Paris has been burning, but Macron is hoping to help secure Kiev. Cities across France saw violent clashes in the past few days. Millions protested against the president's pension reform. So what is he doing in China? Perhaps looking for a win that he won't get at home. A win that may strengthen his claims to global leadership. And Beijing rolled out the red carpet for him. Xi Jinping gave Emmanuel Macron a ceremonial welcome. He hasn't come alone. Europe's top leader Ursula von der Leyen is also in China. But there's no grand reception for her. China has reserved the top honours for the French leader. And he's returning the favor with statements like these. Macron says Europe should not decouple from China. We must not be naive. Our European Union, taking the step of European sovereignty that I defended five years ago, is establishing trade defense instruments that are necessary for our credibility. But the EU must also be voluntarily committed to continuing to have a trade relationship with China. De-risk and not decouple, that's the message from Emmanuel Macron. EU chief Ursula von der Leyen used the same words a few days ago. And yet the import was quite different. Von der Leyen seems deeply sceptical of China. 
how China meets international obligation regarding human rights will be another test for how and how much we can cooperate with China. Just as China has been ramping up its military posture, it has also ramped up its policies of disinformation and economic and trade coercion. That should explain why the red carpet was reserved for just Emmanuel Macron. Either von der Leyen wants to play the bad cop or she has clear differences with the French leader. This visit was supposed to project European unity and they're trying their best, at least in front of the cameras. The European leaders are sticking to the message, they're engaging with Xi Jinping together, but Beijing is paying more attention to Emmanuel Macron. Because after Angela Merkel, Macron has been seen as Europe's de facto leader and perhaps China hopes that when the time comes, he will be able to sway Europe. On his part, the French president is going all out. He wants to use this visit to bolster ties with China and he's come with some 60 business leaders from France, a business delegation of 60. They're eyeing big-ticket deals. So business is very much on the agenda. And of course, they spoke about the war in Ukraine. The French president thinks that China can play a big role in ending hostilities. The war led by Russia in Ukraine has profoundly affected the international order that we have known since 1945. And this war, which I have repeatedly described as imperialist and colonial, has violated many of the principles of the United Nations Charter, which we, two permanent members of the Security Council, must resolutely defend. So China, precisely because of its close relationship with Russia, which has been reaffirmed in recent days, can play a major role. Reports say Macron has seen China's peace plan for Ukraine and on some fronts he agrees with Beijing. Today he asked Xi Jinping to reason with Russia. The Chinese president has called for peace talks. I know you are attached to respect for the United Nations Charter, to strict compliance with the text applying to the nuclear field and therefore to everything that allows peace and stability on the planet. And in this respect, the Russian aggression in Ukraine has struck a blow against this stability. It has put an end to decades of peace in Europe, and I know that I can count on you, under the two principles that I have just mentioned, to bring Russia to its senses and everyone to the negotiating table. Resume peace talks as soon as possible. In accordance with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, take into account the legitimate security concerns of all parties, seek political resolutions and build a balanced, effective and sustainable European security framework. Connect the dots and this is what you'll see. Emmanuel Macron is appeasing Xi Jinping. It's a strategy that he's tried before only to end up with egg on his face. You see, every now and then, Macron tries to insert himself in global conflicts. He tries to play mediator between two warring factions. And does he succeed? Let's look at the, the track record. During the Trump years, Macron tried to save the Iran nuclear deal. It didn't work. In 2018, he went on a rescue mission to Washington. There were handshakes and chemistry, but there was no changing Trump's mind. He tore up the Iran nuclear pact. Then in 2022, last year, Macron tried to negotiate with Vladimir Putin. This was before Russia invaded Ukraine. The French president had a flurry of phone calls with Putin. He also traveled to Moscow. You may remember this picture. There were no handshakes this time. At the Kremlin, Putin gave Macron the long table treatment. He was made to sit 10 feet away from Putin. Needless to say, he returned to Paris empty-handed. And now he's trying to play peacemaker maker again. But this approach could not have been more flawed. He's hoping to strike peace with a leader whose core policy is expansionism. This engagement is a double-edged sword and Macron, who's on the back foot at home, may also end up losing support in the region. The only person it benefits is Xi Jinping. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, President Zelensky has a new demand. He wants more military jets. He's talking about a warplane coalition. In the battlefield, he's on the back foot. Ukraine is struggling to hold back Russian forces in the east. Reports say Bakhmut is slipping. It's a strategic city and Ukraine is not being able to keep it. But Zelensky insists they've not lost. 
At the same time, he made a telling admission. He said Ukraine could be forced to withdraw if casualties pile up. They're calling it strategic withdrawal. It's, it's a withdrawal all the same. Zelensky spoke about it in Poland. He was there yesterday to shore up support. Poland is a critical ally of Ukraine. And here's what Zelensky said. We just need not stop in solidarity. When the battle requires artillery, it should be provided. When victory requires tanks, their roar should be heard on the front line. When independence requires air forces, we should not pay attention to how Russia will react to aircraft in our country. We shouldn't think about which number looks safer next to the letter F-16 or some other. It is worth acting. Acting in the same way as your leadership has proved itself in the tank coalition, and I believe it will also prove itself in the aviation coalition, because this is a battle for freedom, and it is impossible to win it partially. Remember, Poland was instrumental in getting Western tanks into Ukraine. Now Zelensky wants it to lead a warplane coalition. Warsaw has already sent four jets to Ukraine and Poland's president has promised more. Four MiG-29s that remained in storage have been handed over to the Ukrainian armed forces in recent months. Four MiGs are now being given, so eight in total. We are ready, as I told the president, to give six more that are currently being prepared. We assume they could be transferred soon. Notice that he didn't mention F anythings. Ukraine has been getting Soviet-era MiG fighter jets from its allies, but it hasn't received any American jets yet. And Zelensky is obviously not happy about it. Also because he's losing Bakhmut. This city, Bakhmut, is the center of the war's longest and bloodiest battle yet. For months, Russia has been trying to capture this eastern city. Moscow says it is strategically located for further offensives. Kiev and its allies say it's not that important. But they don't want to hand Russia even a symbolic victory. That's what they're saying. Russia recently said it had captured Bakhmut. But Ukraine denied it. It said the announcement was Russian propaganda. Like in any war, both sides are using psychological warfare to misrepresent ground realities. It's difficult to say who is speaking the truth. It's difficult to verify what the actual situation is. But Zelensky's latest speech hints that Ukraine could lose Bakhmut soon. For me, the most important is not to lose our soldiers. And of course, if there is a moment of even hotter events and the danger we could lose our personnel because of encirclement, of course, the corresponding correct decisions will be taken by generals there. I am sure about that. However, the more relevant ammunition comes to Ukraine, the faster we will be able to overcome the situation, not only in Bakhmut, but throughout the territory of our country. He spoke of encirclement and correct decisions by the generals. That doesn't sound like Ukraine will last long there, if they haven't been routed already, that is. So Kiev is once again reaching out to its allies to help turn the tide. Without its Western allies, Ukraine could very well capitulate. And of course, Russia knows all of this. Moscow has slammed what it calls NATO's proxy war against Russia. President Vladimir Putin continues to blame the West in general, and the US in particular, for everything that has unfolded. This is what he said to a U.S. ambassador during a ceremony in the Kremlin yesterday. Relations between Russia and the United States, on which global security and stability directly depend, are experiencing a deep crisis, unfortunately. It is based on fundamentally different approaches to the formation of the modern world order. Dear Madam Ambassador, I don't want to break the serenity of the diplomatic credentials receiving ceremony, and I know you may not agree, but I cannot but note that the United States uses in their foreign policy tools, such as their support for the so-called color revolutions, support in this regard for the coup in Kiev in 2014, ultimately led to today's crisis in Ukraine and additionally made a negative contribution to the degradation of Russian-American relations. He's talking about a revolution some ten, 10 years ago. It led to the ouster of Ukraine's president, Viktor Yanukovych. Yanukovych was pro-Russia. He had to leave office. The U.S. is said to have supported that protest. And Russia used this as an excuse to target Ukraine. It invaded Crimea back in 2014. Now, the U.S. does have, does have a long history of trying to force regime change, but so does Russia. 
It has been accused of interfering in the domestic affairs of foreign nations. There's obviously Ukraine. Moldova too recently accused Russia of trying to foment dissent. So meddling is not behavior that's unique to the U.S. And nor is it likely to stop. And as usual, we in the rest of the world will continue to face the fallout of these great power games. In Jerusalem, tensions and violence are escalating. It's happening at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israeli defense forces stormed the compound for the second night in a row and they forced out Muslim worshippers again. There's been widespread condemnation. The world is calling for calm, for an end to the violence. I can tell you that the Secretary General is shocked and appalled by the images he saw this morning of the violence and beating by Israeli security forces inside the Al-Qibli uh, Mosque in Jerusalem. At a time of the calendar which is holy to Jews, Christians and Muslims, this should be a time for peace and not violence. Places of worship should only be used for peaceful religious observances. So on the violence that we saw uh, very recently, um, at least uh, starting with the mosque, we remain extremely concerned by the continuing violence and we urge all sides uh, to avoid further escalation. It is imperative now more than ever that uh, Israelis and Palestinians work together to de-escalate tensions and restore calm. The Arab world in particular is incensed. They've condemned Israel's actions. And this comes at a time when countries like Turkey were re-establishing diplomatic ties with Israel. We always say that there has been a normalization process with Israel and our dialogue has started again. But our relations with Israel cannot be at the expense of the Palestinian cause. We cannot make compromises from our beliefs in this matter. Before starting my words, I strongly condemn and curse Israel's action, attacking people overnight without discriminating between women and children who have no intention other than expressing their faith, practicing their religion and worshipping. Jordan rejects and condemns any Israeli steps that would affect the sanctity of the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque and stresses its unwavering demands to stop all measures aimed at changing the historical and legal status of the city of Jerusalem and its sanctities. These are all strong rebukes. But why exactly is the situation spiralling so much? Why is everyone on edge? The answer needs a bit of context. The Al-Aqsa Mosque compound is the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. It is where the Prophet Muhammad is thought to have ascended to heaven. It is also extremely important to Judaism. This compound is thought to be the site of two of the most important ancient Jewish temples. Both temples were raised thousands of years ago, first by the Babylonians and then by the Romans. Now the compound houses two mosques, both built over a thousand years ago. So as you can see, the site is contentious. Plus, it has a complicated legal status. Israel occupied East Jerusalem during the 1967 war. But they made some concessions to East tensions. The Israelis agreed to some restrictions regarding the Al-Aqsa compound. So Jewish people are not allowed to pray here. They're allowed to visit the site, but they're not allowed to pray here. That right is reserved for Muslims. And this is monitored by Jordan. Jordan is a neighboring country. It oversees the status quo at Al-Aqsa. This is the arrangement. It's rather precarious, so tensions flare up every once in a while. Which brings us back to present day. Israeli forces raided the Al-Aqsa compound on Tuesday. They say they did it after reports of a riot. They say Palestinian worshippers had barricaded themselves inside one of the mosques. They'd also stockpiled fireworks and stones. And these were reportedly used against Israeli forces. They came under attack when they tried to clear out the mosque at night. This is Israel's version. Now it's not clear why they wanted to remove the worshippers. Apparently they weren't allowed to stay at the mosque overnight until the last 10 days of Ramazan. Ramazan is the holiest month in Islam. It's on as we speak. And Israel is citing these restrictions. Now, Jordan says there are no such restrictions. Remember, Jordan is in charge of maintaining the site. It says there are no restrictions on people staying overnight at the mosque. 
So there is some discrepancy here, but there is no doubt about the violence and more events that are being seen as provocations. Israeli forces release these videos. They show violence inside the mosque. Another set of images shows the IDF beating up people. The visuals are extremely disturbing. And this has triggered fighting between Israel and Gaza. Gaza is controlled by the militant group Hamas. And they fired rockets after the raid on Tuesday night. Israel responded with airstrikes. Now the area around Al-Aqsa is under restrictions. Palestinian men under the age of 30 have been barred from entering the mosque compound. In defiance, they're praying on the streets. And this is what complicates the story even further. Yesterday was also the beginning of the Jewish festival of Passover. Israeli forces were seen escorting Jewish citizens around the site. I want to be very clear. We will hit anyone who tries to harm us, and there will be a heavy price that will make them regret any threats against Israeli citizens or IDF troops. I hope we all enjoy a happy and peaceful Passover. Everyone seems to be ramping up the rhetoric. It is causing tensions to rise and things could turn bloody again. Last year, similar raids took place at the Al-Aqsa compound. It resulted in an 11-day war between Israel and the Gaza Strip. More than 250 people died. But even before that, in the year 2000, tensions at the Al-Aqsa Mosque set off something worse. The second Palestinian Intifada. Intifada means uprising in English. Israeli politicians entered the compound. It set off an almost five-year-long conflict, which claimed thousands of lives. In a world already struggling with war, the last thing we want is more bloodshed. And while tensions flare up in Israel, Saudi Arabia and Iran are talking peace. Do you know where they're doing this talking? In China. The thaw between Saudi Arabia and Iran was a landmark event. It was made official in Beijing and now China seems to be dictating the next steps. Iranian and Saudi officials are back in the Chinese capital. And this time Beijing is hosting the foreign ministers of both the countries. Again, this is the first, the highest level meeting between Iran and Saudi Arabia in more than seven years. An agreement has been signed. They will reopen their embassies and consulates. They will resume flights, facilitate visas and send delegations from the government and the private sector. Saudi Arabia and Iran issued a joint statement and this is what it said. The two sides emphasized the importance of following up on the implementation of the Beijing Agreement and its activation in a way that expands mutual trust and the fields of cooperation and helps create security, stability and prosperity in the region. For China, this was yet another opportunity to blow its trumpet and take a victory lap. As a good friend and partner of the Middle East countries, China will continue to respect their autonomy as a force supporting reconciliation, peace and harmony in the Middle East. China will work with Middle Eastern countries to implement global security, development and civilization initiatives to promote security, stability, development, prosperity, tolerance and harmony in the Middle East. A good friend. That is what China likes to call itself. Beijing seems to be dictating the terms of this truce. But what's in it for China? Economic benefits and political heft. China has two priorities in the region, energy and economic ties. Let's talk about energy first. And this is pretty straightforward. China is among the biggest importers of energy in the world. In 2019, about 67% of China's energy came from outside. The crude oil came from imports. Saudi Arabia and Iran are the leading exporters. If they're friends, China can easily ensure energy security for itself. Its second priority is economic ties. In 2021, China and Iran signed a major pact, a 25-year cooperation agreement. By some estimates, this deal was worth $400 billion, but the plan was a non-starter. For two reasons. A, the American sanctions against Iran, and B, the volatile situation in the region. Saudi Arabia and Iran were arch rivals, so China did not have a lot of room to operate. But now they're burying the hatchet, and China can pursue more deals. It can expand the Belt and Road Initiative in West Asia. After all, less conflict is always good for business. China would have learned this by now in Pakistan. In West Asia, here's the next challenge it faces. Not fighting is one thing. Working together is quite another. Can China get Saudi Arabia and Iran to work together? They've been arch enemies for decades. 
They have religious differences. Iran is a Shia majority country. Saudi Arabia has more Sunnis. They're also involved in a power struggle. They've been fighting proxy wars in Syria, in Yemen, and Bahrain. There has been deep mistrust and open hostility. Can China undo decades of bad blood? Also, where does it leave the United States? The writing is on the wall for Biden and his team. America's influence is shrinking. China is becoming a force to reckon with. So will the U.S. give space to China? Or will it compete? As of today, they can't seem to decide. There are two camps in Washington. One says the U.S. should rethink its approach and reclaim its space. The other says this is the perfect opportunity for the U.S. to walk away, to leave behind West Asia and its never-ending conflicts. Whichever side prevails, one thing is certain. America is no longer the dominant power in West Asia. It will have to learn how to live with the dragon. Now to Japan. It is struggling with twin challenges. It is trying to deal with bird flu. It is mass killing chickens. Japan has culled more than 17 million chickens so far. But here's the second problem. It can't find land to bury all these chickens. It's running out of place to bury these birds. There is not enough space. And not burying them on time will mean that they got killed for nothing. It's essential to bury infected chickens so that the virus does not spread. Our next report tells you more. Japan's poultry sector has come under severe strain. Egg prices have gone through the roof. And chicken consumption has become a risky affair. A massive outbreak of avian flu, also known as bird flu, has forced Japan to take some radical measures, like killing millions of chickens. 17.4 million to be precise. That's right. Japan has killed over 17 million chickens this season. Perhaps Japan acted without thinking this through. Now, it doesn't have enough land to bury the culled chickens. Local governments and farmers both have the same complaint. There's no space to dispose of the carcasses of the chickens, and that poses a threat. If not properly disposed, Bird flu can cross over to other animals and humans. The virus can lead to severe pneumonia. So it's very important to handle dead chickens infected with avian influenza with care. Some farmers are resorting to burning the carcasses. Japan has 26 prefectures or provinces. Bird flu has broken out in all 26 of them. And about 60% of these prefectures are having trouble disposing the dead chickens. And it's just one of many challenges Japan is facing. The mass culling of chickens has led to a supply constraint. What's worse, laying hens, kept just for egg production, have been killed too. About 9% of Japan's egg-laying hens have been culled. So egg supplies have gone down and prices have shot up. Eggs in Japan are now 70% costlier than they were a year ago. Even big food chains are taking a hit. McDonald's Japan and 7-Eleven are among the many food chains that have suspended egg-related food items. Those that haven't have increased the prices of such food. As of last month, 20% of 100 listed companies in Japan have suspended egg-related items. And while Japan's case is severe, the world is going through an outbreak of bird flu. It began in October 2021. Since then, Almost 42 million individual cases have been recorded in domesticated and wild birds. Almost 15 million birds have died due to infection around the world. But that's not even the most staggering number. Close to 153 million birds have been culled in the past two years alone. So it's not just Japan where chickens are being killed. It's more a global phenomenon now. And there's no indication that the situation will improve anytime soon. And now let's shift focus to digital India. It has become a force to reckon with and the world is watching. The most recent example is the International Monetary Fund or the IMF. It has lauded India's digital public infrastructure. It has called it world class. The IMF says digital India is a role model for other nations. And it's right. This is the golden age for technology in India. 
Just look at the numbers. Less than a decade ago, 60 million people had access to broadband in India, 60 million. Today, that figure is 800 million. More than 850 million people, in fact, have access to the internet in India. Every month, there are 8 billion UPI transactions. UPI is an instant real-time digital payment system. And it is reaching the last mile in India in small towns and villages. You see, India's digital infra is fascinating. And it has a superpower. It has changed itself with the times. Technology ka sahi istamal puri manavta ke liye kitna kranti kari hai iska udharan bharat ne digital india bhihan ke taur par pure vishwa ke saamne rakha hai mujhe khushi hai कि आठ वर्ष पहले शुरू हुआ यह अभियान बदलते हुए समय के साथ खुद को विस्तार दे रहा है। Apart from this, India's very belief of sharing its success has helped the country. We are talking about open standards. This means anyone can use India's digital infra. I'll give you some examples. Look at the healthcare sector. The IMF says it has been massively impacted by digitization. And it has, like the COVID platform. It is India's COVID-19 vaccine distribution platform and it became the country's digital backbone during the pandemic. It enabled quick vaccine delivery throughout the country. It helped overcome challenges of large-scale migration during the time. The world has learned from India's COVID. And its technology has been deployed in several nations now. The list includes countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, Sri Lanka and Jamaica. They're all using Indian technology and India's learnings for their vaccination programs. Services in India have increasingly become paperless. Most things can now be done online, making access even simpler and more efficient. For instance, identification, your ID cards. You may remember a time when we all had multiple identity cards. Now we have one. It's called the Aadhaar and it gives universal coverage. It has the ability to handle data of more than a billion citizens. Over 1.3 billion Aadhaar cards have been issued till date. 1.3 billion. It requires minimal information like name, age, gender and it has a quick rollout speed. This is what helped it get vast acceptance. By contrast, how are other countries doing? with their digital ID rollout. The IMF says most have hit stumbling blocks. Another layer that has been completely transformed is payments. Digital payments like the UPI have penetrated into our lives seamlessly. Today, UPI is the most popular payment mechanism in India. Merchants and consumers have both इसे ज्यादा से ज्यादा वे अपना रहे हैं इसलिए आज बहुत से एक्सपर्ट्स ये अनुमान लगा रहे हैं कि जल्द ही भारत में डिजिटल वॉलेट ट्रांजैक्शन नकद लेन-देन से अधिक हो जाएंगे we look at it as a tectonic shift in user behavior where people are now willing to adopt digital payments because the government has incentivized them. India has also shared its fintech with the world. Citizens can do cross-border UPI transactions with a number of countries, including the US, the UK, Singapore, the UAE and Australia. And what's behind India's digital innovation? The IMF has the answer to that too. It says this is because of India's special focus on a building block approach. It refers to basic tools that provide tailored solutions. And this has been crucial for India because we are a vast country, we are a diverse country. The right policy initiatives have done wonders. India's digital public infrastructure has transformed the economy, it supports inclusive growth, and India is emerging as a leader in the global digital economy, showing no signs of slowing down. Do you have tens of millions of dollars to spare? If yes, then Dubai's housing market is waiting for you. It has become the world capital of luxury housing. You can buy luxurious apartments with a brand name like Four Seasons, Bulgari, 
in Kavali, or even man-made islands and rooftop opera pavilions. And believe it or not, these luxurious properties are selling like hotcakes. The residential market has seen a growth of about 70% since last year. It's clear that Dubai's property market is red hot and it's not willing to cool down any time soon. Dubai has always been affiliated with the rich and famous. But over the past year, this has reached another level thanks to its housing market, which is on a high note. With affluent buyers eyeing its ultra-luxury homes, buyers are paying anything from tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, breaking sales records month on month, marking a growth of about 70% this year. Despite last year seeing a record-breaking high too, property worth $56.6 billion was sold last year, which is an almost 80% gain from 2021. And one segment is giving Dubai's real estate market this boost. Branded homes. These are development projects with luxury names. And they make up about a fifth of the value of all apartment sales in the city. They sell at about 30% more than non-branded homes. They have the security of a name people trust. And better amenities too. But the brands benefit from this as well. They get a hefty commission with each sale along with a management fee for quality checks. But branded or not, luxury homes are a world of their own. They provide the obvious services like housekeeping, valet and concierge. But they also have private white sand beaches, infinity pools, theatres, saunas and spas, opera pavilions, on-site restaurants and even water mazes. And such homes are spread across Dubai. But the hotspot is in and around the Dubai Creek. This includes the sprawling Palm Jumeirah, Dubai Marina and downtown Dubai, which is home to the towering Burj Khalifa. What's even more interesting is how the property market in Dubai is going against the general trend. Home values have dropped across the world. There are surging interest rates and recession fears. It has darkened people's general outlook. But there is no stopping Dubai. The sales have increased significantly. Like just from the first half to the second half, there was a 37% increase for these developments. Um, records have been breaking at the land department as well. It's been one of the most uh, busiest in sales-wise. So why is Dubai's luxury real estate booming now? Prime real estate soared about 90% last year as compared to the year before that. And this was a swift recovery, to say the least, after it braved a slump from 2014 to 2020. There are two clear reasons. First, the rich got richer during the pandemic. Secondly, foreigners needed a safe investment to stash their money, like Russians. They were the biggest international buyers of Dubai real estate last year and started looking for investments due to growing uncertainty, mostly the war in Ukraine. But other non-residents weren't too far behind. British, Indians and Italians were also top buyers. But now we're seeing a lot of customers from Europe who are wanting to move here, who are wanting to send their kids to school here, start business here, look for jobs. So we, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, new clientele and, the, and they have kept the market very busy. And it's worth mentioning that this surge in property has benefited some, but also created a nightmare for others. New tenants, we're finding they don't complain about the pricing, but people that have lived here, especially for a while, um, are very not happy with how high the prices have gone. The leasing market in the last year has massively changed. Um, it's great for landlords, but it's not so good for tenants. Dubai rents have increased by over 50% in a year. It's becoming expensive for those who live there. And it will continue to be this way, if not worse, in the foreseeable future. But then again, some people are willing to pay the price. And if you're one of them, now is your chance. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We start with some weather updates. The U.S. states of Iowa and Missouri were hit by tornadoes. Parts of Canada are facing thunderstorms and rains. A lightning apparently struck Toronto's CN Tower. About 800,000 people across Ontario and Quebec were without electricity. In Algeria, acute moment was caught on camera. A cat jumped on an imam while he was leading Ramazan prayers. He gave the cat a gentle pat and continued. And finally, what happened today in history, the first ever modern Olympic Games 
were opened in Athens. The year was 1896. More than 200 athletes from 14 countries participated in 43 events. But women were not allowed to compete. It was thought that including women would be impractical and uninteresting. Four years later, women made their debut with lawn tennis and golf. India sent its first contingent to the Olympics much later in the year 1920. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.